Welcome back to another episode of Psycho Cinematic. Today I have another exciting guest and no, the Blue Eye Samurai content does not stop because today's guest is the supervising director, Jane Wu. Jane is also a storyboard artist and she has worked on many incredible projects such as Guardians of the Galaxy, Into the Spider-Verse, and even House of the Dragon. So without further ado, here's Jane. I'm so glad that you are on the episode today. I can't wait to pick your brain about all things Blue Eye Samurai, plus uh, your career as a whole because from what I understand you have done a bunch of storyboard artwork for some pretty crazy projects so if you wouldn't mind just uh, getting into a little bit of your background and sure. uh, you know what mm -hmm. got you into all this and now you as a supervising director first of all thank you for having me here and i um, happy to do this uh, my career was not was not a straight path uh, I never meant to be here I didn't know I could be here so this is all a surprise to me as well. I, my formal training is in fashion and costume background. And from there, uh, so I, I was doing fashion and teaching fashion by day. And by night, I had a comic book store. I owned a comic book store because my comic book collection in high school got out of hand. So a couple of friends and I decided to own a comic book store because what do you do with the comic books? And I got to befriend a lot of comic book artists at the time because I thought, oh, I can do penciling because this this is what I like to do. But there, there just weren't a lot of women back then doing it. So I never got the opportunity to pencil. And um, a lot of these comic book artists ended up in animation and they thought I would be good at it. So I just, you know, I put together the worst portfolio ever. And this is before, you know, we had digital anything. So it was in a big black portfolio and it was just a bunch of illustrations and drawings and figure drawing. So it just showed that I could draw and that's about it. And I turned it in and I thought I'll never get called. So I just, I literally forgot about it. And it was like, almost like nine months later, when Sony called me, I had forgotten I put a portfolio in and they said, well, we want to hire you for a cleanup position. And at that point I thought, oh, you want me to clean up like bathrooms? What's a cleanup? Like that's how much <laughs> I did not even know about the business. So that's I decided funny. to try anyways, because I realized I did not like the fashion business. I liked fashion as an art, but I didn't like the business. It was very hard. I mean, imagine just not knowing anything about any industry and just getting drop kicked into it. And then the other aspect was you were in a environment full of dudes and bros. So I had to figure out how to quickly fit in. I, I came in as a cleanup artist, I guess in, in today, what we would call a revisionist. So a storyboard artist would just do his or her um, rough drawing, and then somebody else would put it on model, right? So I did that for a little bit. And then I moved into character designing because I because of my fashion background and costuming background, and I can draw humans very well. And I did that for about a year, and they wanted to elevate me to lead character design, and I said no, because I can't stand drawing slow in the same thing twice or three times. And I said, I wanted to storyboard. And uh, my then executive says, do you know how? And I said, I could learn. How hard is it? It was very hard. <laughs> I didn't know when to cut. I didn't know when to pull for a close up. I just, I knew nothing about that aspect, but I knew how to do comic books. I understood that. So I just didn't understand how come that skill set wasn't transferring because you know right. now you know that's very different. So I talked to a lot of friends. I got myself a lot of books, and I said like it was the summer of. I just went home and trained right after work every day for the full summer. So like, turn on the Eye of the Tiger soundtrack, and that's what I was doing like every day at home, because I was just going to give myself this summer to figure this out. I I was not doing well at work in terms of storyboarding because I I used to remember I would turn a sequence in. And my friend who was the director at the time would stay late and correct all my boards. 
And I felt bad because then that means he, he wasn't going home to his family and he was staying late because of me. Yeah. And I felt so bad. And I thought, okay, I'm just going to give myself this summer. And if I can't figure it out, I'm going to go back to fashion because this is, it's, I'm too old to be learning another industry from the ground up. Do you remember what year this is? Yeah, this was 97. Okay. So in training, something clicked. And I remember the board I was doing, and it was on Men in Black. And I think it was 103. It was it was the one with um, the alien, the, the alien creature. I remember doing that whole thing, and I got it. And just something clicked. And I remember turning it in, and my director just kind of, looked at it and just cracked a little smile and went, all right, cool. Good job, woo. And then I like walked away and I'm <laughs> like, yes. That's the men in black animated show. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. So, you know, that parlayed that, that, so I stayed in animation for about seven years. So I moved from Sony to Disney and I just, I, I realized that you know, what I did well and what I like to do were very hardcore action. And that space was more in the, what what the children's animated space would call boy space, right? In the blue space, because that's, that's all the action shows. Once I got to Disney, you didn't quite have much of that. So there wasn't a lot of work for me. And if there was if there wasn't an action sequence, then you would put me in a co- comedic sequence, which... Like I would rather stab eyeballs in my eye than do a comedic sequence because I'm just not funny like that. And I don't draw cute. And and I just was kind of done. And I knew that I needed to be in live action because as soon as I see action sequences and so forth, I would get excited. I I would think, oh, I want to work on that. While I was working on Tinkerbell, like five or six, because I did tons of Tinkerbell, (laughs) um, I get this call from this little studio called Marvel that was just getting up their first movie. And they said, hey, would you come in to talk to Joss Whedon? Because he heard of you from two separate sources and he would like to meet you. And I thought, yeah, because I had a comic book store. Of course Mm -hmm. I know what this is. And I only collected Marvel. So... I went to meet him. I showed him my work and he hired me and, you know, we all worked on the first Avengers, which none of us understood how big it was going to be or how groundbreaking. We just Mm -hmm. knew we loved the character. We wanted this movie to exist because this is a movie I've always wanted to see. And, uh, and then I got stuck at Marvel for like years and years and years. Um, So I had been working in the live action space then for a good 10, 11, 12 years, happy in live action space until I get this email from Netflix saying, um, would you come back and and would you consider a animated project? And at that time I told my agent like, Oh no, I I don't do animation anymore. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, this is adult animation. And my ear just went, boop, picked <laughs> up. Said, oh, adult animation. Now, I'm from Asia and I grew up in Asia. So we have adult animation and it's normal. So like the Godfather of Tokyo and like Psycho, Psycho something, I can't remember what it was called. You know, and things like Tikon King Crete and like all day. And so we never did it well in the West because, you know, we just kind of have this pre preconceived notion that animation is for children because thank you, Steamboat Willie. Right. Mm-hmm. And Disney and all the stuff that they put out. So naturally you go, Oh, I don't want to watch animation. It's for yeah. kids. Unless it's South park or something like that. <laughs> right. Which is uh, the, the style of those kind of animation isn't really what is put in the forefront. It's the writing. Right. Mm -hmm. And there is, there is space for that. Those, those shows are funny and they're great, but what about for people that want something a little bit more world building, more spectacular. Right. So I had always thought that, yeah, you could do this right, but 
you know, never had the opportunity to do it. And I bailed on animation and I went to live action. And so I thought, oh, that's interesting. I'll just take the meeting. And at that time, Mike Moon was the uh, executive at Netflix Adult Animation at the time. And he said, Jane, I don't know anybody else that could do this except for you. And I said, what made you think, what makes you think I'm, I'm the person for this? And he goes, just, just read the script, just read the script. So I read it and I said, gosh, darn it. I know exactly what to do. Mm -hmm. This script really embodied all the opportunities I had thought oh, you know what you could do? You could do this, you could do this, you could do this. And pull from all of my experiences with live action and animation and bake it together. Really the thing that drove me over the edge to take this project was the idea of somebody doing it wrong. Yeah, that's a good point. Because <laughs> like I saw the whole thing in my head. I, saw, I thought, okay, I got to do this. I got to do this. And when I met Michael Namber, and Irwin, it was amazing. You know, when when you go meet the showrunners and the executives, you roll up your sleeve, you think it's going to be a battle, you think it's going to be a fight, but it was like finishing each other's sentences. It was all kind of reference, referencing the same things. And it was really simpatico feel to the group and the dynamic. And we argued about how long the cape has to be. <laughs> that was pretty much like one of the mm -hmm. most intense arguments. But, you know, in you know, that, that's a testament to having the same core values of what right. we wanted from the show. I never felt so supported before from like the executive standpoint of view and from the studio standpoint of view. I said, here's my pitch for how I see this. I want to do for this show what I what Game of Thrones did for TV. And having worked on Game of Thrones and being part of that team, I saw the way they built the team and I saw how they hired and I go, I'll just do that. I'm here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I even said, you know, things like, I want to make this really different um, in a way that no one's ever seen before. And in order to do that, you got to break the wheel. And I want to break the wheel. I want to break the traditional animation pipeline. Yeah. And they just looked at me and they went, yeah, okay. Like, that's it. No fight, no like questioning. And I was like, oh. Yeah, that's got to be rare. It was so rare. You know, I got to hire my own team. And it was funny because it's like, I've been out of animation for so long. I don't even know who's who anymore. So I needed help to hire. <laughs> I had a group of people that I worked with before. So they came back um, much older. By the way, when I got hired and I signed my contract, two weeks later, the entire world, world shut down for COVID. Mm. So this was 100% remote project gotcha. and it was you know you remember how confusing it was during that time like yeah <laughs> okay so here i am i got hired and i'm going to do this animated project and nobody was contacting me and so i even had to call netflix going hey you guys are we still doing this yeah <laughs> you know they're like we are we're figuring some things out i'm like oh okay you know once the production started rolling it was sort of like riding a bicycle and it was kind of like, right, what do we do now? Oh, right, that, okay, that, right, we got to do that, yes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like six months into it, then it was all the memories flooding back of, you know, these are the procedures and these are the things that we ask for. Yeah. Um, but it was very much a teaching show in that, you know, because I infused so much live action mythology and philosophy into the show a lot of my an animation people really had to be taught that philosophy same with the live action people right i had to say okay on this part we don't do this we do this because that comes a little bit later that's that's a different part of the aspect that that's broken down so mm. i was literally the translator all the time which fit yeah. me well because being bilingual what other language do you speak i speak chinese fluently and okay I understand Japanese and uh, Korean in, in a very simple form. Like mm -hmm. if people were talking, I, I know what they're saying, you know, gotcha. I just couldn't respond cool. in a full sentence um, because I'm out of practice, you know, just to wrap this whole philosophy up. Mm -hmm. I really took from Mizu's character, like she's biracial. She has a fusion of both. And I just thought that's exactly what our production has to be in order to be different, right? It has to have mm. a fusion of animation and live action. That makes sense. Every time I felt like, okay, 
what am I missing here? I come back to that philosophy. When we're in a panel and people are saying, oh my God, you're, the Blue Eye Samurai looks so different and it looks so unique. What's the new technology? It's not. It's a 20-year-old outdated 3D Studio Max that we were on. The only thing that was unique to this process and that that was truly new is our philosophy. So do you think that now that you guys have had this crazy success with Blue Eye Samurai, a bunch of people are going to follow suit with their projects of merging live action with animation? I hope so. That's the plan. I really wanted to make this so people like you and me have other alternative stories to watch because animation has a magic onto itself without even trying. And it's another, it's a, it's just another wonderful way of delivering stories in another level. And again, people like you and I have grown up with anime and animation all of our lives. So we are used to watching that language. And so to mature it just makes sense. Mm -hmm. To go back to your storyboarding background briefly, you know, I understand what a storyboard is, but I've never seen anyone work on a professional storyboard. So I'm curious, you know, like what are the rules for that? Do you have to draw every camera angle that's going to be there? How detailed do those drawings need to be? It varies artist to artist, and it also depends on the director and what they're used to seeing. So because I work on very, very complicated action sequence, let's just take any one of those Marvel movies, right? Mm -hmm. I do tend to animate it out because I want you to see how the camera moves. And also because of my martial arts background, I can choreograph martial arts, I can choreograph a stunt sequence. So I tend to draw out all the the, the movements yeah. of, of that action. So I go overboard when it in in terms of live action because i want you to fully understand it because sometimes if the camera is sweeping and you get an arrow you don't know how fast i want to sweep that right. is it a snap is it a snap you know, you know is it a whip pan or is it a slow boom dot uh, a boom shot or whatever you don't know so i step it out for you so that you can see what my intentions are because storyboards are the first time you've ever seen the sequence up in a visual form from the script. From the storyboard, you should be able to make a lot of decisions, production decisions, like you know, production design costume, how many stunt people you need, what kind of cameras you need to have on set. Those are all important information you need to have before then you start budgeting how much that set piece is going to be. Um, and on top of that, once the storyboards are done and it's being brought into uh, the previous stage, the previous artist needs to see what the intentions of those camera moves are and how fast mm -hmm. and how slow and things like that. Because my philosophy is as a storyboard artist, I'm really there to help the director's vision. So the more I can take off his plate, which is do the storyboards in such a way that he doesn't have to be there to represent it, and it goes straight into uh, previs and he sees it he goes that's exactly what I was thinking yeah because the directors usually you know they're pulled like in 10 different directions and mm -hmm. if I can help him or her be one less problem to solve right oh and the and the thing about like you know how rendered my my boards tend to be not very rendered because I have no time to draw them mm -hmm. so they're usually just like three lines and we're done but <laughs> I really focus on the clarity of the storytelling and the clarity of the action. Mm -hmm. That's why I don't tend to over render it because once you over render it, it's hard to, your eyes have a hard time settling on what you're supposed to be looking at. How early before the production starts uh, or like shooting starts, uh, are you working on the storyboard? Cause that's gotta be one of the first steps, you know, after yep. writing and all yep. that. Yeah. Um, I'm usually, I usually come on really, really early. Like even on, on Shang-Chi, they hadn't cast yet. I would say a good year and a half. Wow. <laughs> a good year and a half, yeah, is about right. Because you should only be storyboarding for about two to three months, six months at the most, if you have a huge production and a bunch of action sequences. Storyboarding is is a tool for 
for problem solving. And a lot of these problems have to be solved up front before you start building, before you start choreographing anything. Are you being assigned just a couple scenes? Is the team big enough to basically just split up the movie in like 30 different parts and everyone just does their part? In in a big Marvel movie, you usually have like six board artists mm. and maybe three of us are, you know, considered veterans. And then we would take those big horrendous action sequences. <laughs> It is it is experience. And because I've been on set for so long, what, when you start designing a, a sequence, you start thinking, what kind of cameras get brought in? If you're doing a techno crane, you better have a good reason to bring that techno crane in because that guy is big mm -hmm. uh, and it takes a long time to set up. And how many times are you using that techno crane? If you're just using it once, you better have a really good reason to bring that camera in, right? right? So understanding camera, understanding like, shoot days like in a big action sequence if i'm excited about like a one -er, you know like the whole thing that you know do they really have time to do a one -er? because that reset on a one -er is hell right yeah so is it worth it right. is it called for at this point or if i'm not put on a like a huge act three final battle kind of thing and it's still an action sequence i go oh okay I just need to hit these story points and I'm in and out. So let me make this a little bit simpler because we're not going to want to put our eggs in this basket. We need to save all of our eggs are in that basket coming up. Mm -hmm. So it's just really understanding production. And so I, I'm, I'm a very production friendly storyboard artist. So generally a lot of things that I design in storyboards get made because they can. Gotcha. So being the storyboard artist really is like, you just have to have a great knowledge of production. So you, every step of the way from the motion of the camera to how much it's going to cost to what the action should look like to display like the coolest fight scene. Like you have to worry about all of that. I worry about all of that, all of that. Um, and I, I think because I've been in the industry for so long and I, I see all of it and I see the problems, like sometimes when I do a certain board and I go, oh, they're stuck on that. They can't get that. I see. And it's it's a feedback and input to go, next time I do this, I have to be aware these things are problematic. But I tend to giggle in that if if a DP goes, I can't, how do you, there's no way to do that. And go, I bet you that's going to be a cool shot when a DP says, how do you do that? <laughs> they, they usually end up figuring it out and it, it does end up to be a cool shot. That's cool. Do you have a background in film? Uh, so my background, so I'm just a freelance videographer uh, in Reno, Nevada. I work uh, a lot as like a freelance editor. Um, oh, okay. And yeah, so I actually was going to say for you with the supervising director, I would imagine that communication is just paramount and being paramount, able yes. to effectively communicate your vision with the team but also criticism with the team and what you really need from them has got to be huge because I, I i know in my experience when the communication is not there it is the most frustrating thing and then i like the amount of renditions i have to create because i'm not understanding what the vision is or right. you know right. it, it it gets really chaotic <laughs> and i think to what you're saying, it's important that the people that you work with have a same set of lexicons that mm. we all refer to, right? One of the hardest things is that in animation, I don't know for what reason, every single camera move is called a pan, but that's not so in live action, right? Yeah. Because what what you call it is what the operator is going to do. It's a tilt. It's not a pan. So trying to communicate that to the animated story team saying we tilt up here and then we say you mean pan i said yes it's a pan but trying to change your language to tilt because this is how we do it in animation uh, in live action calling it a dolly not a pan because that will feel different this production was very much a teaching production and on, on the other aspect like communicating not just saying, we're going to cut for a medium close-up here, but imagine your supervising director saying, we're going to cut, a, cut in for a close-up here on a 40. And if you're for animation and you don't ever do lensing, you're just like, <laughs> 40. Yeah. yeah. 
So it's it's teaching them why we have to lens, why we have to lens up. It's it's an animated CG show. And you get into a virtual space, there is always lensing. And mm -hmm. I'm not going to let somebody else decide lensing because part of about being a director is lensing, right? Yeah. You lens up. I did a lot of like little tiny mini classes. Like in the morning, I would just say, hey, you guys, grab your coffee, grab your donut. We're going to sit here. I'm going to just do a little quick cliff note class on lensing quick cliff note class on certain performances and i do think you know I've, I've taught for many years and i think part of my ability to communicate an ability to do structured criticism um structured right <laughs> not just criticism yeah uh makes a lot of difference and from teaching you know i have learned how to how to give notes without making it sound personal and say, here's what you did well, here's what can work, here's what needs to be lifted a little bit more to to hold hands with what you did well. Because if you're just always criticizing on what they can't do, mm -hmm. you're not showing what they can do and focusing on that, right? Yeah. And, and pushing them to what they can do well. Yeah, and I would imagine too, I mean, it probably helps, especially because you have uh, worked on other animated projects, but if you weren't communicating effectively, uh, they could become, I don't know, resentful about your cliff note classes. Like, oh, what's this live action talk? You know, like, can we just do an animated show? Like, I don't know why we need to learn right. this kind they, of thing. Everybody that came on was very aware of the fact that what I was doing was trying to do a mixed culture of live action and animation. So this is why we're going to pull this aspect into our show. And that's why when you're watching it, you go, oh, it feels so different. It's mm -hmm. because of the lensing. It's because of where we put the camera. You don't traditionally see that in animation. You yeah. see a lot of this in, in live action. Why don't you just shoot it in live action? Well, because then you won't have the magic of what it is in animation. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's, it's like when, when you go to a restaurant and it's a Asian fusion thing and you you taste it and you go, wow, this is an explosion of all these different things mixed into one. And it tastes very refreshing. Mm -hmm. That's what it's supposed to be. It's funny. You kind of touched on it right there a little bit. Do you ever foresee them making uh, Blue Eye Samurai a live action series or a movie? I would love them to, but I don't know. It, it, it all depends on people like you. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, part of the reason why uh, Netflix greenlit the second season was just the immense fan base that it built so quickly and how mm -hmm. much people were demanding and it's good to see netflix hearing the audience and what they want to see so yeah it depends because you know netflix is such a data-driven company right we don't get to decide you get to decide yeah. the comments were getting extremely rowdy <laughs> you know people yeah, talking about like i'm gonna fucking kill netflix if they don't if they don't renew season two you know i posted something up on my web uh, on my ig account i had made this uh mizu doll for my showrunners for christmas that first year we started because you know i had a little bit of time and i even said i made this in 2020 and one of the one of the comments was jane get your act together stop making dolls and get get on season two already i was like damn <laughs> so if they if they did that would you be the director? Would you want to be the director? I'm going to say yes now, but who knows where, where, where we're going to be in five, 10 yeah. years, right? Mm -hmm. um, definitely feeling like I really know and understand Mizu, but it could be by that time, there are other directors that know and love Mizu the way I know it. So with you guys now getting a season two, which I'm so pumped about, uh, and everyone can put their pitchforks down. <laughs> um, yeah, right. How many seasons do you think it would take to tell Mizu's full story? Like, have you talked to the writers where the story all goes? Like, do, do they have the end in sight or are they just writing, um, you know, one season at a time? I don't know because I remember working on season one, like during the crunch time, they, you know, we were just kind of casually talking about season two. And I just said, I, I, I can't think about that right now. I got to land this plane right now. I, I can't think about that. Mm -hmm. So every time people want to talk about it, I've always blocked it because I couldn't focus on it. You know, right. um, now that we're here, 
I'm going, so what was that you guys were talking about? But, you know, everyone's like gone, you know, everyone's, everyone's taking their own breaks. And um, so, no, I, I don't know how they're parceling it out. I don't know. But again, I, uh, the one thing I know for sure is that it's, it's what the audience is looking for. When I was talking to Brian, he was talking about how Netflix didn't immediately rehire everyone who worked on season two, just because they didn't know if they were going to do a season two. Uh, do you get say in, you know, are you, are you able to fight for them? And like, what's the status on that? Have they been brought back in now that it's renewed? It's been renewed, but nothing has been like we all left. I don't work mm -hmm. for Netflix. I, I left the, the show in August. So you might not even be the one. Who knows, right? I mean, wow. we, we all have to come back and renegotiate because I have other things that I've been eyeing, you know, and there's also other studios that are eyeing me. So mm -hmm. it depends on like what lands on my plate first. Gotcha. Well, I spoke too soon about the putting pitchforks away because I think they're <laughs> they're coming back out now. <laughs> well, I mean, there is going to be a season two, you yeah. know, who is on the roster, who's coming back, who's on the bench. That That's all being figured out right now as we speak. I am hoping we can put the band back together because it was such an incredible team. I tend to run my productions like a war campaign. We left no one behind. <laughs> Everyone yeah. came back alive, sort of, maybe bruised, maybe a missing limb, limb or two, but we left nobody behind. And we are a band of very, very tight team. I do hope the band gets back together because we now really absolutely have a shorthand mm -hmm. that would make season two that much more badass. So if you had to like kind of bullet point or, you know, like summarize just what exactly a supervising director does like maybe what the day-to-day -day looks like because obviously you're you're kind of managing these teams and it sounds like you're basically like a live action director but now for animation um right what does that look like on a day-to-day -day basis it starts early in the morning where i have to be in a meeting with my french animation team to go through mm -hmm. shots to go through any questions um <clears throat> as a supervising director I hold all the story in my head. I hold what also the visions are looking for in that script. And I have to be able to communicate that and interpret that to throughout the team. So after my morning animation call, I mean, I literally have back-to-back -back schedules of then I sit in with editorial and we would start editing and maybe that is only three hours. And then I got to pop out because I have to be then in storyboards to go to help the director go through storyboard and check sequences. And mind you, this is also a culturally sensitive mm -hmm. story in that I became like the cultural police, you know, so yeah. I had to watch it to make sure that culturally it was done properly. And then I would have to go to another meeting which is, you know, the production design. And I would have to go through phases of different designs with our production designer, which you should talk to. Yeah, um, yeah, I'll, I'll give you his information. Definitely like sit with him to go through research, to go through all aspects of it, right? How it's being, how the set is being used. Go to previs, then check the shots that they're, that they're interpreting through storyboards. Is the camera moving, you know, the way we want it? Is the length of the shot correct? And then at the end of the day, uh, maybe it's to sit with production team to go through some deadlines and where I have to apply pressure, you right. know, because of deadlines. Yeah. Once a week, we would have this thing called Roman Turtle where I get all the leads in. And we huddle and we say, all right, what are the problems that you're having? Where can we relieve stress? Sometimes we just shoot the shit. Sometimes we talk about movies we saw. It's just to keep the team as tight as possible. Because as soon as, you know, anybody starts to stray from that tightness is when I say that's when the arrows come in and shoot us and one of us dies. That's that war campaign you're talking about. Yes. <laughs> your Roman turtle. That's right. So being the supervising director, do you sit in on the voiceover? Do you like listen yes. to it afterwards? All of it. Yeah. Like okay. you, even in the beginning. So what I was describing was more of a day in, 
during the height of production, yeah. but in the beginning, yes, I was in it during, um, you know, casting also weighing in on voices and things like that, uh, in the records, helping the showrunners and the actors, because again, you know, they, they've never done animation before. And I had to, sometimes I would have to remind them, you know, you're running at this point, so don't read it. Mm -hmm. You should be huffing and puffing, you know? Right. Sounds like you could easily be spread too thin. How do you manage? Way too uh, thin. I couldn't, I didn't, I <laughs> don't know. It's just grit. It's just, there are a lot of late nights. Um, I certainly don't want to do it like that again. It, it did compromise my health quite a bit. You know, when you're locked in the seat like this 24 seven, and I also had to jump in and storyboard as well. I think it's because a show like this has never been made before. And because if I'm saying I see it in my head, I really had to lead with example and show them what this needed to be. And when I say, you get it, you, you see what I'm trying to, okay, okay, now you do it. But yeah, everything in the beginning had to be, here's what I would like to see and giving some example, doing the boards, um, doing a little cut or researching examples and things like that. That all takes a lot of time. I mean, just the very fact that it's a historical piece and then you add like that it's an, another culture to it, it just sounds very exhausting. And it sounds like you've got a lot of plates that you're balancing at the same yeah, time. I'm really happy it was done. You know, and, and all this hard work and seeing how well it's been received and seeing how people are seeing the details and seeing how people are catching them, like it was totally mm -hmm. worth it. Totally oh, yeah. worth it. That's awesome. There would be nothing worse <laughs> than if you didn't get that kind of satisfaction that, you know, seeing the audience and how they've reacted to it. That's got to be a really good feeling. It is. And I also think that that's what make, makes this adult animation is that the detail that goes into the sophistication of how we deliver the story, how we tell the story and knowing that somebody like you will see these little tiny details and go, oh, that looks cool because you can see it. Mm -hmm. Right. Maybe for a, a kid's space, it's not as important because they're they're they haven't seen a lot, so they won't catch those little details. And mm -hmm. that's also for children's space in storytelling. That's not important, and that's not where the key focus needs to be. So it's yeah. just adjusting these perceptions and knowing where to adjust. Was this your first time uh, being a supervising director, or had you no. already done it before? No, I had I done it before back in the Sony days. So I was a supervising director for Jackie Chan Adventure, awesome. uh, and <laughs> and then um, Men in Black season three. Yes, that's cool. I, I was wondering if whether or not like they hunted you down for this position, like we need you to be this position that you've never done. We just trust that you could do it, or if you had already had that prior experience. Yeah, they they. They probably saw that I had in a prior experience and it's good that I had the prior experience because I know how to mm. run a team. Is it different 20 years later? No, it's not different. The technology is different, but how you run a team, how you inspire a team, how do you motivate the team? How do you assess how much work a team uh, can have, how much you can push them? You know, all that stuff is still the same. If you were doing this live action, like would it, require more or less of a budget oh that's interesting because I, I don't really know what animation costs if we did it exactly like the way we did it in in season one it would mm. require more budget you know we opened our camera and really had this huge scope right so either we have to go on location and find those places or we have to build it and mm. then to build those sets to fill that camera or then to have that in a cg shot Mm -hmm. That's very expensive. In our production, I, I said, I want to do all these things that are too expensive in live action to do. <laughs> yeah, the, the one that I think about uh, that was just one of the coolest images, it, it probably wouldn't cost that much to do live action. It would probably be pretty similar, I would imagine. But uh, it was just the arrows coming over the mountain yeah. in episode one or two. I can't remember. 103, uh, one, 103. 103, yeah. Yeah. That was so cool. And when I, I watched that, like that felt live action to me. That felt uh -huh. like a, uh, I don't know, just a crazy war scene. And um, I could... That's when I was like, all right, this could definitely be a live action series. It can, but those arrows would have been CG, which is yeah. animation, right? So, or you um, could do it real. 
so dangerous. That many arrows? <laughs> yeah, it's very no. dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. So imagine like the amount of people or the amount of amount amount of mechanics you need over that cliff to fire at the same time right. and to get the light shooting just right. And that mm. reset the poor the poor grips and not the grips the the <laughs> prop people that have to pick up those arrows again yeah that reset would take hours right mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah you probably forget a few arrows couldn't find them yeah like so that. no that that would definitely be a CG shot yeah and, um you know like we looked at heroes or hero uh that Zangimo movie uh, with Jet Li oh yeah he had a he had a shot similar to that it was all CG. Yeah, well, when you have like the the CG shot on, because it'd probably just be a CG sky, like just completely CG. It doesn't look so bad. It's when you like marry them that um, I feel like it when the light looks a little different on like the arrows right. versus that's, something else. So yeah, that be... that's that's in your compositing, right? That's when your compositing artist mm -hmm. has to have that artist eye to make sure that the lighting's hooked up right. Yeah. Yeah. When you worked on the live action Mulan. Uh, I wanted to ask you, what was that like? Because that was like the first uh, movie, if I'm not mistaken, that didn't go to theaters. It went to video on demand when they thought it was going to theaters. No, no, no. It, oh, it didn't go on theater? I, oh, it might have had like a brief run, but I know Disney Plus had it for like $30 to watch it. You know why? It's because... Mulan had really bad timing. It came out just right when the pandemic was about to hit. Yeah, I remember getting texts and calls from my relatives in Asia saying, we're locked down, we're out of toilet paper. I'm going, what? That's mm. crazy. That would never happen here. But then thinking, the, hearing the way it sounds, I go, you can't contain a virus. Right. Right. And people are traveling back and forth. And I was like, wonder how long it's going to take before we lock down here. So I went to go get toilet paper first. I remember going to the premiere of Mulan and two weeks later we were locked down or a week later we were locked down. And because mm -hmm. of that, there were no people going out to theaters. Right. Yeah. So a lot of movies that were coming out then just went straight to streaming. And so mm -hmm. that was just the unfortunate nature of what happened with COVID and how it hit filmmaking hard you're probably pretty pumped to be working on live action mulan i mean being able to speak chinese yourself like that's super cool and then i think you've also worked on mulan too um yeah. and like full circle uh, right yeah the the hype was real and then all of a sudden it's like oh but it's not going to theaters but it's okay because nobody was going to theaters <laughs> yeah. had it gone to theaters we wouldn't have sold any tickets right right so at least people still got to see it yeah I mean, yeah. what's interesting now is who's going to theaters now? We don't have COVID. No one's barely anyone's going to the theaters. And that scares yeah, me. Yeah, I go by myself love... all the time. <laughs> right. And then there's you, like no one you in and theaters. Like, you and five other people that are sitting there and you're going like, oh my God, how are they going to sustain? Mm -hmm. But some films need to be seen in a theatric mode. And Agreed. I just saw Godzilla minus one, which was mm, brilliant. So I can't good. imagine seeing that in a little tiny thing. No, that movie was awesome. Wasn't that great? Yeah. It, just that very beginning scene felt so much like the feeling of watching Jurassic Park for the first time. It yeah. was just, it was incredible. Yeah. And I remember being terrified as a kid watching Godzilla. And then, you know, the remake in the, in the 2000, I'm like, that's not scary at all. But this mm. one scared me again. I know. It, it made me think about uh, just being out in open water and especially anywhere around Japan and how <laughs> I just would not want to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, that's that's great filmmaking. And I, yeah. I want people to still go to theaters to see this experience, you know? If someone is trying to get into uh, basically working in the art department in some fashion, whether that's a storyboard artist or maybe uh, you're an animator yourself, what would you say to um, basically get your foot in the door and start working at one of these companies? Is submitting a portfolio still the, the entry way in? I get asked that a lot, and I want to talk about this in a philosophical way of a swordsman, right? Of somebody who does martial arts. You never know when battle is coming, so therefore you must train all the time. You must make sure that your sword is sharp and your skill set is good. Because when that battle comes to you, you have to win that battle, which means you never know when you're going to get that opportunity 
you never know when you're going to be able to get that foot in the door. You should be constantly working on your skill set. If your if your skill set is good, somebody will find you. Somebody will say, "Hey, that looks really great. Come on board and try doing this." Getting your foot in the door. Everyone's going to always have an opportunity, but being able to keep that opportunity and parlaying it to the next thing is the hardest. Not getting that opportunity. So that's why I want to go back a step and say, "Is your kung fu good?" Mm-hmm. Is it sharp, right? Nowadays, these kids have this thing called Instagram and you put all your portfolio up there, right? And all I have to do is character design. And I look at a bunch of people. We didn't have that during in our days. We have to carry a portfolio, know, know somebody and knock on a door. Mm-hmm. So everyone is going to see your artwork because you can put it up there publicly. But is it is it good? Is it what it needs to be? And I always say like don't be a jack of all trades. Even if you are, I would keep an account for just character design. I would keep an account just for storyboards, just for production design, whatever. Because if you right. put all of it in the same account, I'm going to say, I don't know what you do. Yeah, it's funny because Brian was saying the same thing, like don't be a jack mm-hmm. of all trades. It's very interesting. So once you got in and you were doing something, then that's when you can, I guess, see if if storyboard art is even something that you like at a professional level, or if it was just something that you like doing before that. And then maybe you can pivot once you're in there, if you're not like a jack of all trades and you specialized in that. Yes. But I would say what you're good at and what you like is also two different things. You really have to like it. Mm. Yeah. You know, there's, there are students that I get that want to storyboard, but I could tell when they're doing it, they don't like it. Mm. It's like, painful but they want to do it and i said you know there's other ways to tell stories because if you don't like it you're not going to be up at four in the morning trying to cram in that deadline you're going to not want to do it yeah right so even before you get into the industry just have an idea of what you like Mm. because what you like is what you're going to spend hours practicing and doing and once you have those hours in you actually can start mastering what you're doing. Much harder to burn out on something that you love. Absolutely. And mastering is what I like to teach a lot of these newcomers that it's not, it's, it's not just, I know it. Can you master it? That's a huge difference. That's a, that's a difference of why these basketball players get paid millions of dollars because they can be consistently good. That consistency is mastering. Yeah. Yeah. So would you say that to increase the chances, or maybe there's almost no chance anywhere else uh, for, I guess, what you do, do you need to be in LA? Uh, No. During the pandemic, we worked with a lot of people all over the place. What is important, though, is the networking, right? I know you, you know me, and you go to another production, you go, oh, you know what? Jane does this really well. You should talk to her. Right. Or hey, I know Victor and Victor does this really well. You should talk to him. It's all it's all networking. If you can't be here in LA, is there a social group that you can be in? Or, you know, again, there's this thing called Instagram. Can you yeah. follow somebody and then start, you know, getting a relationship with, with them and saying, and, and just follow the productions that they're on and see who's on, you know, like, I guess that's stalking, huh? That's not good. <laughs> um, it, uh, I guess it depends how you go about it. <laughs> right, right. There, there, there is the the, the non creepy way to go about it, but <laughs> I, I think networking is really important. I I don't do this online thing well, but you know, if there are like uh, meetup groups, right, that does something that you're interested in, get to know these people. You can't if you're going to sit in your room and be on, behind a computer and just wait. Nobody's going to find you. Mm-hmm. But if you network, somebody will find you. Yeah. You got to do the groundwork there. Let me ask you, uh, what would you do with your comic book store? (laughs) Three years into it, um, we sold it because we were barely breaking even. And really, it wasn't trying to make business. It was just a place where we can all hang out. It was like Cheers, but a Mm -hmm. comic book store, right? After three years of opening it, that wasn't going to be a career. We all realized it's not a career. And then we had to get our career started. All of our work individually started getting a little bit more um, intense. 
and we had less time for comic book because it, it was still a lot of work to run a comic book store, you know? Yeah. Uh, so we just, we closed it and we sold off all of our inventory to our other friends who had comic book store. Right now, I just have a short box of all of my important comic books. You had to purge. <laughs> I did. I did. But that was, um, that was a lot of fun. That was a mm -hmm. lot of fun. I was sitting there arguing with kids because like I, my, my location was across the street from uh, elementary school, which is not a good mm -hmm. idea because then they come to me and after loiter. school yeah, and I become daycare until their parents mm -hmm. come pick them up. Right. Yeah, I'm sitting there fun. arguing with kids. <laughs> I know, I'm sitting there arguing with kids like, well, who would win in a fight? Like, would it be like Wolverine or <laughs> Superman? I'm like, yeah, of course, Wolverine. What are you crazy? Which martial arts do you know? I practice wushu, mm -hmm. which is a traditional Chinese martial arts. And it's, you know, the way I describe it is it's all the crouching tiger, hidden dragon stuff. So you, uh, you actively do that today? Oh God, no. I'm too old for that. <laughs> That's for youngsters. Gotcha. Uh, I'm 55. So mm. there's no way my body's going to be able to do that stuff, but I have the knowledge of it. You do not look 55, even though we're saying uh, 97 is when you were uh, uh, you. submitting a portfolio. I would not have guessed that. Yes. The the exterior doesn't look like what I, my biological age, but my, yeah, it, it, the, the inside, the pipings. Like it. <laughs> yeah. 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 And then, so if that's like the crouching tiger, uh, that's translates pretty well to screen for like the the martial arts 100 percent, 100 percent. that type of martial arts was really made for screens because it mm -hmm. it's long it's beautiful it's dynamic unlike you know a boxer which is more mostly hunched and you're not your your movements are um not seen as clearly so uh before we wrap this up i want to ask if you had to choose what your favorite project that you've worked on is it blue eye samurai or is it something else gosh it's all different it's like asking me to pick my favorite kid <laughs> every single one of those projects that i've been on have a special meaning for me and a special impact for me i think working on game of thrones i would say it's my favorite but it was, i think it was the most impactful because i've mm. never been in a situation where i panicked so hard because you know i'm good at this I mastered it, but then when you're on a team where everyone's mastered everything and the schedule is that tight, oh my God, I panicked. And you were doing storyboard art. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I did, um, I did the episode and I hope I'm not spoiling for everybody, but you should have seen all of it by now, but, mm -hmm. um, where the dragon dies. So I storyboarded that whole sequence and also the frozen lake, um, uh, zombie attack and all that stuff. Nice. Uh, that was a lot of work in a very Was that all in the same time. episode? Okay. So they hire teams just for one episode and like, that's how fast they got to make them. Yeah. It, it, again, it depends on the director because the mm. storyboard artist is so connected to the director because gotcha. they're the one that comes out with the director's vision. And I pretty much work with Alan Taylor all the time. And just for clarity's sakes, he is my life partner. Mm. So wherever he goes, I, I, you know, go with him and I work on his stuff. So I also, uh, storyboarded on House of Dragons season two. Wow. So a lot of those sequences uh, that he's directed uh, are my boards and shots that we've worked on. And a, a lot of directors will have their favorite board artists and they'll just take them everywhere they go. Because th again, there's a shorthand. How cool is it to see? So, I, I mean, we haven't seen House of the Dragon season two. Maybe you have, I don't know if it's done um, how cool is it to see like basically your storyboards come to life? It's super cool. And it's super nerve wracking as well, because mm. I mean, I, I have, my situation is a little bit different because I literally sit behind the director because he is my life partner. Mm. I can tap his shoulder and go, Hey, that's not where the camera is supposed to be. Or, Hey, that that's the wrong lensing. You know, gotcha. or I could remind him and go, Hey, wait a minute, look at the storyboards. And it's not to say that it all has to look exactly like my storyboards because sometimes if another department can push it and make it even better, you know, do it, right? It is rewarding <clears throat> to see the shots come together because it is, I'm still learning. And so it it's a confirmation of, yes, yes, that worked. Okay, I was right. Or then if it didn't work, you're like, 
yeah okay i see where the, why the camera couldn't be there like once we were working on uh game of thrones and we had to go to iceland to shoot and i had to do this whole icelandic snow sequence with zombie attacking i was saying like okay they were walking i said let's just do a dolly track to follow them as they talk and then and then alan looks at me the director looks at me and goes how are we going to put a track in the snow? It's like, <laughs> oh my God. Yes, that's right. So this has to be a handheld. So the quality of the shot's going to be, do okay, let me redo this. Let me redo this. You know? Wow. So th that's something crazy. I hadn't even thought about until you were saying that part was that like you are there on set with them and that's too, so you, you, you have to see the set before you can start the storyboards sometimes okay. sometimes i will start it and then i'll bring that information to the production and say this is as this is as wide as we're going to open up the camera so we don't have to build everything else out because that that'll save money right mm -hmm. it it really depends on what the schedule is who got called on and what's going on i love when this when the set is already there because i can go there and look at it and go oh okay i could just use this corner and this corner is it normal practice to bring the storyboard artists on when they're actually finally shooting it? It depends on the director. Okay. Wow. It's that's so crazy. You would think that'd be unanimous. I almost acted like the the storyboard um, protector, right? So when I'm there, I make sure the storyboard's out. I mm. make sure it's all up there. There's rarely been a, a situation where we say we can't do this. We have to change a shot. Jane, can you draw another one? Rarely. In fact, it, it may have happened once, but because that's why you go into prep, right? That's why you pre-decide a lot of these things. So when you're shooting, you're not wasting that time and running, right. burning money. But I'm just there to make sure that the boards get put away at the end of the day and people know where they are. It doesn't get destroyed. Gotcha. And well, I, I feel like I've learned a ton from you and I am oh, so thankful that uh, you were the supervising director for Blue Eye Samurai because it doesn't sound like that there was a better choice out there. And I really oh, hope you. that you'll be on season two as well. Well, me too. And class dismissed. <laughs> <laughs> if people want to find you online, where can they find you? I do have uh, an Instagram account. It's Jane Wu underscore 626. You can find yep. me there. And that's it, because I don't do social media well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll put that below in the de in the description. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Victor. I had a wonderful time.